Hello and welcome to the final instalment of Society Language Difference. This week we're going to look at the condition of the postmodern, of postmodernism, and we're going to try and get some traction on what postmodernism actually is, uh, what it was claimed to be, and what it means, both within the frame of our own course, our journey through post Second World War continental philosophy, um, and then also. Um, how it kind of not only kind of challenges some of the um, political optimism that we've talked about a lot in the 1960s about revolution, but how in other ways it's a continuation of the critique of people like the situationists and others into the complex, manifold and ultimately tragic ways that capitalism permeates our existence and subjugates us as wage slaves. Um, as it is the final week, I can promise, I hope, enlightenment at the end. Probably not. Um, and what we'll try and do through this is, it's thread through, through thinking about postmodernism as a kind of scepticism about narratives of progress, um, a wider tradition of critique, of critical theory that's threaded through a lot of our thinkers on this course, whether they be working in a revolutionary Marxist tradition like say the Frankfurt School um, or in a feminist tradition like the thinkers last week, um, Sisu, Irigre and others, in a psychoanalytical tradition, in a post-colonial tradition like Fanon, uh, in their own wonderful tradition like Foucault. Okay, right, over the next hour and a half, I think that's how long this is going to take, we are going to be covering the following things. Yes, George Bush Sr. is going to make a cameo here too. Um, we're going to talk, first of all, about um, what I call counter-reformation. In a previous week, I called it the problem of June 1968. Um, we're gonna, but what we're going to look at is a series of unfortunate events uh, that happened, I guess, from the late 1970s into the 1980s in France. We're focused on France. Um, that not only cause a mood of political pessimism on the left, um, but also result in a scepticism um, about the claims of some of our thinkers about the dizzying freedom envisioned by people like Deleuze and Guattari and others. We're then going to tell you what you want to know, <laughs> or perhaps not, what is postmodernism, um, or use Jean-Francois Lyotard to understand that. We're then going to uh, dwell on our thinker for this week, it's Jean Baudrillard. We're going to be looking um, at the idea of the simulation from his work Simulations and Simulacra in 1981. We're then going to uh, turn to an, another bit of Baudrillard from the same book um, where he basically um, he hates the Pompidou Center. This is part of a chapter called the Beauborg Effect. We're then, I should say that um, if this lecture is coming to you fresh, um, that um, the recording um, is meant to accompany um, a couple of readings that this will hopefully elucidate um, Baudrillard's simulations and simulacra, of which I think we're looking at the preface and chapter five. Um, but then also uh, Baudrillard's very curious claims that the Gulf War did not take place, which happened over a series of articles in The Guardian and somewhere else. Um, and we'll look at those two. And then in the final part, we're going to round up on this course. It's been 11 weeks. It's been an interesting journey uh, through continental philosophy, through critical theory, through different traditions, often lambasted in the English speaking world. Where have we got to? And where does this get us? And does the course end in the year 1991? What's happening today? We'll cover a little bit of that too. OK, right, let's talk about counter-reformation. So part one. Let's have a look and a think about the dizzying optimism of May 1968, of which we spent a class about a month ago now, um, looking at the Situationists, the Situationist International, Guy Debord, Raoul Van Agheim, um, and how this moment of great revolutionary desire, a desire that um, wanted to kind of explore the possibilities of refusal Herbert Marcuse talked about the necessity of a great refusal, a refusal to work, a refusal to participate in society. For Marcuse in the late 1960s, this could largely only take place not through the industrial workforce, the proletariat, 
the traditional subject of collective political action for Marxists. Instead, because these guys have been bought off, basically, and, you know, my view quite right, cannily, this is a, a fair observation, because um, revol desires for revolution had disappeared in the urban working classes by the late 20th century, there needed to be an understanding of a new political actor. Marcuse talks about artists, artists and misfits. We get in Foucault and offers an interest in the conditions of prisoners. There's an interest in sexuality, in discriminated um discriminated groups, minority groups in different ways and, and protecting and advancing their rights. We'll also remember with Raoul Van, Van Gaim this claim, this desire for a society which involves a, a quote, refusal of all constraints. We ask critically, what does that mean? What would that mean? What does it mean to uh, reject power? To refuse hierarchy when well, it kind of stems from not just a political anarchism the, you know this the, the rejection of the necessity or legitimacy of hierarchical government um but also stems from a kind of romantic impulse a romantic egalitarianism that by nature and maybe there's a bit of rousseau in this by nature man should be free um by nature we should not be dominated. No gods, no masters, the traditional uh, anarchist slogan. And so May 1968 was a kind of a refusal. We talked about what did these people, these young people want? What did they want? Well, it, maybe it's a bit unfair of me to have kind of implied that they, they didn't really want anything concrete because we know that it stems from a series of student struggles around um, uh, gender partition dormitories where girls were not allowed to sleep with boys and vice versa um but there's also the workers strikes at this time the 10 11 million workers on strike um a desire for the working week to be reduced uh, improved wages yes there are these concrete things there and yes there is an opposition to charles de gaulle who's been in power since 1958 i think 58 um 10 years following an effective coup d'etat um, in which the Fourth Republic was dissolved by by the French military, who were anxious about what's happening with the war in Algeria. So do these movements, but of course this is a wider movement, isn't it? It's a wider rejection of young people against, because these are university students, um, against the inevitability of a of a drudgerous white collar or maybe kind of better blue collar like foreman on a factory line type job the drudgery of the world that wouldn't deal with the conditions of fascism which were not just simply in german military defeat and perceived humiliation but in the sense of fear that had struck so many following the great depression of the late 1920s and the and the sense that the existing democratic parties no longer represented the people were corrupt um, that existing democratic institutions could not ever be useful um, bastions of the people's well-being. And so therefore the turn to unconventional political actors, people with military connections, people who promised to drain the swamp. You can see where I'm going, can't you? Um, by, um, by offering a new kind of sped up form of government, which kind of did away with, um, you know, some of the kind of slow legislative processes that was wary of uh, invested elites and promised the people real returns that is of course the story of fascism of course there are forms of totalitarianism too and there isn't anything like this um offering to the people with um the bolsheviks well i suppose in 1917 they offer a promise to the peasants peace and bread these are not really marxist offerings are they that anybody could offer this stuff but it has an appeal they survive a civil war and what happens under lenin and then under stalin is um a cruel a cruel tyranny a cruel dictatorship um in which many millions um are killed and many more millions live in a state of total fear for many decades so totalitarianism what are the conditions of that it isn't just in military defeat it's in fear how do we alleviate fear how do we respond to fear? 
Well, that's kind of what our thinkers have been doing in different ways on this course. Think about Franz Fanon. Think about his concerns about the self-hatred of the colonised, their own sense of inferiority. Think about Foucault and the ways in which language and what we say and what we think can not just constitute our sense of self, our subjectivity, but it can also imprison it. Think of how some can be deemed mad and others reasonable. Think of how um, experts and discourses of expertise can be used to reproduce the social order in different ways. There are always relations of power. We are always in fields of power. This is something that Foucault advances, but it's reminiscent of Spinoza's own perspective about how power works, something that had been kind of brought to the table in this context through the work of Deleuze, Gilles Deleuze. Others like Alpha Serre, also important. We looked at that in a previous week as well. So in response to fear is an understanding of power. And though some, some of our thinkers on this course were better able to articulate it than others, there's also the politics of desire. Very romantically put forward, something like Raoul Van Agyem. More fully set out, I suppose, by Deleuze. And then more explosively set out in the, um, in the uh, uh, philosophical modernism of uh, Deleuze and Guattari's anti-Oedipus. Thinking about desire being everywhere. There is only desire and the social and nothing else. Desire invests all forms of society, democratic, liberal, communist, fascist. Therefore, we must be aware of the fascism that is inside each of us. In that sense, anti-Oedipus was meant to be an ethics. That's how Foucault describes it in his wonderful preface to this book. It's a morality, it's a guide to the non-fascist life. So if we're trying to think about May 68 and what, what these young folk are after when they're smashing up the school desks and placing them into barricades. They're picking up paving stones underneath is the beach and throwing them at the police. Then there is something happening here. It isn't just youthful dreams, although that is a big part of it. It isn't just pleasure, although that is a big part of it. It's also about a form of refusal of fear. It's also about exploring the pursuit of one's own desire as a means of presenting oneself as a subject in the world in which one can resist the forces of conformity and coercion which end up putting us into lines running us along timetables having us defer our desires as Jacques Lacan says carry on working work must go on that's why desire is so important but what does desire mean and is simply the pursuit of our desire always going to result in some inherent good, some form of liberation. Well, in that score, we have to be careful too. What would liberation mean? Foucault even makes this point uh, much later in his life when he's uh, doing this work on the history of sexuality. Um, the six volume series that he never completed. And he makes a distinction between liberation and freedom. Foucault is always wary of anybody promising liberation because to claim that you're going to liberate someone from something, you know, in a way that Raoul Van Agheim and others imagined, you know, liberating our desires, refusing constraints, always ends up assuming that there is some natural state that we can, in which the shackles can be re released, which the burden of authority can be released and we can therefore then reach a natural state of human joy, human pleasure, human desire. Foucault's wary of that because there's something um, that philosophers would call normative about that. Someone that says that this is what human nature should be like. This is what human desires should be like. We might want to keep in mind Jacques Derrida here, the work that we did on off grammatology, a difficult book, but a rewarding book, and a book that has something very significant to say about the humanities, about the literary humanities, about the ways in which writers, philosophers, assume that their words connect onto abstract concepts that are universal and unchanging. Derrida is suspicious of that. That's what the technique of deconstruction is trying to explore. Derrida calls it the metaphysics of presence. In a sense, there's a kind of witchcraft, a sorcery, involved in using our words to conjure up um, universal, unchanging realities beyond them. But sometimes these realities are like castles floating in the air, and they're our own castles, and they may 
be um, sinister or beautiful to other people, but they're not always going to take on the same impression to other people. Foucault therefore is wary of anybody promising liberation. Instead, he sees in freedom something different. His work in his final years is all about ethics um, and ethics of freedom, exploring practices of freedom. Freedom involves having a deep, continual series of um, self-examinations um, about power and, and one's own power relations with others, about how different relations of power you probably thinking this sounds abstract, different situations in which we are strong, in which we have the upper hand, as much as when we are weak and when we've been dominated or traumatised or hurt by others, when we've been marginalised, when we've been overlooked, the different ways in which these social relations constitute us as beings. Of course, as human beings, we tend to dwell on the negative. We more, we carry our scars more than we carry our, our moments of joy. Maybe you would differ from me in that respect. Um, but the question then is how do we make sure that we're not complacent and that we don't perpetuate relations that harm others, that weaken others, that make others feel weak, marginalised, different in a negative way. That's an ethical task. And freedom therefore involves that continuous attention and vigilance to what power is and what power does. And our power is enacted by us and through us. In that sense, what our thinkers on this course are offering is something of great ethical importance. But, this sort all of sounds rather nice, isn't it? That's not how it's going to go, chaps. Um, because this section is called Counter-Reformation, isn't it? And there is a Counter-Reformation. There is a sense um, for the mid-1970s that some of these people have gone too far. Now, the reaction is probably more against Jean-Paul Sartre than it is um, against Foucault or Deleuze, but it's a wider response to the perceived dangers of Marxism and far-left politics in France by proxy. And an important moment for this, this is more of a history of ideas type section, is the translation of Alexander Sol. Jeanetsen's um, The Gulag Archipelago. Um, it's translated into French later than it is in English. It comes out in France in 1973, a year after Anti Oedipus, which um, was apparently a bestseller. Here's another bestseller one year later. Some of you might know what the Gulag Archipelago is about. Um, this guy was in a gulag. And this work um, is, an, is kind of an expose, I suppose, from a, an intellectual in the Soviet Union um, of what the gulags were like and what the Soviet Union was like and how it stifled dissent. Now, this book in France is a big event in 1973 because it allows many book reviewers and cultural commentators and essayists to comment on and deride the authoritarian tendencies not just of the Soviet Union, which by 73 were obvious, but of Marxism more broadly. And for some of these thinkers, this was then associated with the radical politics of May 1968. Not just with uh, students throwing stones at police, but with the genuine Maoism, support for Mao and China, that existed among quite a number of left-wing French intellectuals during this time. Alain Badiou, now famous, in English-speaking world, was one of them. This is worrying. We might want to think here too, something that we covered, um, I think it was in the May 68 week, um, about the response of a couple of Lacanians um, to the events of May 68, and a book called the, uh, I can't remember what it's called, that, uh, L'Univers Contestationaire, I think, um, sorry for my pronunciation, um, which basically accused the May 68 protesters of having secret authoritarian desires. They wanted to install uh, a new authoritarian figure, a new father, kind of allegorical father, or kind of father in the Freudian sense of someone who tells us what to do and whose authority we are afraid of, but we kind of secretly desire as well. Now this uh, rather dapper looking dude, 
on the right is um oh god i'm gonna get his name mixed up uh Henri bernard levy um and what you also get uh, from this period too is the emergence of what um, um of the new philosophers the nouveau philosophe uh, who appear prominently on television <laughs> in 1976 enough it is andre glucksman um some had serious connections uh to the um what well, to the former uh, French French far left um, and they kind of made a big deal um, of of having kind of d denounced them uh, of their former comrades and former colleagues I should say this is Bernard Henri Levy this is why I'm getting wrong um, so we start getting this kind of um, kind of popular media savvy we would say um, philosophers public intellectuals who replace I guess the position, the positioning of people like Jean-Paul Sartre in the past. Now, you know, writing for a popular audience, but denouncing Marxism, denouncing the far left. What we also get in the, from the late 1970s onwards, 1980 in particular, is, um, is a number of deaths. So just as we get a reaction against the excesses of May 68, um, we get the untimely deaths of some figures. Uh, Nikos Poulantzas, the um, guy in the middle with the kind of flame hair, a Greek um, political theorist based in France who takes his own life in 79. Jean Paul Sartre and Roland Barthes, Barthes is the guy with the cigarette on the right, both die in 1980. Barthes um, dies in a road accident. Louis Althusser, a Spinozist of sorts, a Marxist primarily. Um, he murders uh, his wife in 1980. He does this in a period where he's uh, severely mentally unwell. But the, it's a it's a wider moment in which Alpha Sir thereafter becomes unspeakable. Well, I mean, there's lots of reasons for this, but the kind of what Al Alpha Sir's broader project, um, a kind of theoretical anti-humanism, a Marxism that made no reference to history. All of this kind of becomes less and less fashionable or interesting. Jacques Lacan dies in 1981. And Foucault tragically dies of HIV AIDS in 1984. So there is a waning of cultural and political influence, and there is also the untimely loss of some of the major thinkers um of this wonderful flourishing of theoretical experimentation that had happened in the 1960s primarily by 1980 much of it is is over it's coming to a pause Deleuze is still doing important work um but le less frequent he's looking at cinema but front is has his book on francis bacon and this becomes a moment for other public intellectuals to um continue their denunciations off not just the guys in the streets the guys and gals in the streets of may 1968 but also this generation of intellectuals too so uh, luc ferry um in this work it's called um, the four of 68 says that the real question is in fact how one went from the militant individualism that characterizes 1968 with the narcissistic and apathetic individualism of the 80s now this is interesting isn't it the militant individualism of 68 and ferry and reno want to make a link how have we you know the apathy of the 80s mtv uh, americanization um a sense that the public are becoming more stupid more dominated by mass media we have this perception throughout time folks if you're thinking oh this sounds like nowadays this has been the kind of the worry going all the way back to plato when um, Plato in one of his dialogues uh, warns uh, that um, writing things down for memory is making people stupid. We should always be wary of this. Anyway, the perception in the 80s is that people are becoming too individualistic. And who's to blame? Well, it was Foucault, Derrida, Deleuze and their ilk. And the, the young students who were inspired by that stuff. Now, let's keep going. What is there any substance to this? Well, Ferry and Renault are trying to are making uh, an, a philosophical argument. Well, sort of philosophical. They say that it is the post-structuralist thought of 68 um, that has 
that has led to this individualism because it has critiqued what they call modernist humanism. So I want you to think here of the um, the the masters of suspicion, Friedrich Nietzsche, Karl Marx, Sigmund Freud, um, and the ways in which these figures in different ways um, critique the the traditional subject of liberal politics some somebody usually a man a white man um, whose thoughts and desires are transparent to themselves in which they are not um, influenced by unconscious desires or advertising nor are they influenced um, by bourgeois ideology the superstructure of the capitalist system no everything is clear we know where we are or do we and that's been what our thinkers have been challenging on this course but very when I say, hold on a minute, this is dangerous, because what's happening here is that our thinkers, Foucault, Derrida, Deleuze, and others, have tried to, and Lacan, have, have tried to take away the subject, the self. Think about um, our discussion of the schizophrenic subject in Deleuze and Guattari. Well, if we take away this idea that there is a singular subject who is morally accountable, then we're opening the door to justifying selfishness and immorality. That's, that's the claim. And this, therefore, is a danger to how traditional moral reasoning works about a self that takes responsibility. This is what we get in Immanuel Kant. This is what we find, I suppose, in, in Aristotle and Plato. If there is no subject, if there is just a, a field, a multiplicity of flows and power relations, then this suddenly sounds like people could maybe just get away with doing what they want. That's the risk. And so it ties into a, a kind of pessimistic moral judgment um, that people are, be are becoming less kind. They're less nice, they're less caring, because they don't need to be, because these bad intellectuals have discouraged them from taking responsibility. They think that moral rights and responsibilities or political commitments to freedom are just bourgeois morality, the morality of the masters, or even a form of fascism. So people like Deleuze and Guattari, folks, if you're wondering why it's gone downhill, in recent years, it's their anti-humanism. They don't believe, say Ferry and Renault, in the genuine autonomy of the subject, because they think that we are permeated by relations of powers, by flows, by forces, which we are acted on and on which we can act against. There's a risk that if all we affirm is just individual creativity or spontaneity, being a desiring machine, That we get no further than simply celebrating our own kind of um, mishmash, um, madcap um, desires and directions. That we're not left with a sense of social or public morality. One that might have more of a place for th things like modesty or humility or self-restraint. So I suppose what we're getting in Ferry and Renault and in a wide range of thinkers is a sense that by in pushing so strongly against the structures of power um, and pushing so strongly in for um, the creativity of desire and the necessity of pursuing desire, that we weaken the social fabric and the bonds of social solidarity and therefore it's not other changes like deindustrialization um, or um, a refusal to um, subsidize them um, I don't know, high employers or social housing, stuff like this. Instead, it's not because of government decisions um, to no longer protect society, but because of postmodern philosophers and intellectuals that the social fabric weakens, disintegrates from the 80s into the 90s, into the noughties, creating a more media-dominated and selfish kind of human being. Now, you're probably thinking, of a, your mind's probably racing here, because this kind of shares in a kind of um, a view, might not always be pessimistic, of the social changes of the last 40 years that we sometimes associate with something like neoliberalism. Who is to blame? What we get in Ferry and Renault is an interesting outlier. It's an argument that will be re reprised by Jordan Peterson and others later in their critique of cultural Marxism. And what they mean by cultural Marxism is a kind of... Um, philosophical, uh, theoretical um, left-wing project um, associated with um, a number, but not all, university intellectuals, people like the philosophers on this course. They're blaming the intellectuals for this. Now, my argument in the next part is that 
the intellectuals are not responsible for this, of course they're not, um, but also we need to be aware of important historical changes. But there's something quite convenient about blaming a declining social fabric on, on the left, on the left blaming itself ultimately, I, I see no other effect happening there. Now in France there are other things that are happening. Um, Francois Mitterrand is elected president of France. He's in power, I think, for 14 years, 1981, I think up until 1995. Now, Mitterrand is a socialist. You can see this here on the left. This is an image um, where he's presenting his platform. Um, and his platform for the, the election, for where he gets in power in 81, is very radical. It's very left-wing. He has a socialist common plan. And this is something completely different to Thatcher, who comes to power uh, in the UK, or Reagan also around this time. This is very left wing, it's going to give the workers way more power. But then what happens? 81, I think it's 81, no it's 82 or 83, sorry. Um, there is an economic crash and so Mitterrand is kind of forced, is persuaded to give up most of this common plan. He takes up a policy of austerity. While he still pursues a so, you know, it's certainly not as bad if you're a working class or low middle class. It's certainly not as bad as, as Thatcherism or Reaganism for you. Um, and inequality in France doesn't widen. It stays the same. This, you know, this sounds like um, not high expectations. But the thing is, inequality substantially widens in the UK and the US. So Mitterrand is able to do some things in government. But the point is that there was so much hope and so much promise and so much energy with Mitterrand's election. His common plan was meant to achieve so much. And yet it's the it's the reality um, of the market, of recession, of being in a global economy, which necessitates, and I'm using these phrases because I'm pointing to decisions that are political decisions and not facts of nature. But this is all used to necessitate a program of austerity and it's enough a moment in which we need to kind of think about why um, the social fabric why the political position of the working class decreases over the 80s in France and why when when we get to Baudrillard in a little bit there is going to be this kind of pessimism about working class power working class consciousness as far as he's concerned it's over and that's because it isn't just working class political power that's diminished in this period but also the the bodies of, of this power, like trade unions, and the ways in which they instill and inculcate a working class identity and consciousness for workers. This all diminishes. Things are changing. Now, not all of our intellectuals pass away, if you'll be glad today, in this period. Um, others uh, become increasingly linked with the United States. Uh, and are given the kind of you know, guest positions in different ways here. Yeah. Helen Sisu is one. Jacques Derrida, very prominently enough. Uh, both of them, Derrida in particular, become well known, possibly even more well known and more appreciated in the United States. Well, actually, this is true of Derrida and of Sisu. Um, than they were in their home countries. Foucault, too, um, before his death, um, finds success in America. He has an association with the um He's based in California for a while. It's in American university departments. It's 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 primarily literary studies, a kind of variant of English, I suppose, in which these thinkers are of interest. They're generally um, too radical for philosophy programs, and there was a lot of interest in applying the concepts of postmodernism and poststructuralism to different texts, different literary texts, different philosophical texts. Of course, we'll get to this in a moment. We have to be a bit wary about what postmodernism and poststructuralism mean. These are both terms that all our, our French thinkers um, reject. They don't want to be associated with this tripe. Um, it is too simplistic, too reductive. Lyotard is different. He is one of the first, to, well, probably the first, to kind of properly popularize the term postmodern and he's writing in 1979 but he's describing a condition and nor is he celebrating it important works of this period um, that define the postmodern condition 
which have more influence, I would say, than Leotard, are works by Frederick Jameson and David Harvey. Jameson, in particular, writes an essay in 85, um, Postmodernism or the Cultural Logic of Late Capitalism. We'll come to these in a moment. But just for this kind of first part, the period of Counter-Reformation needs, needs to kind of be associated with these other moments of deaths, a new kind of political order, and new forms of work that we'll get to. And a drift away, for many, away from the far left, towards a more common sense, you might want to think of Tony Blair here, a more common sense centre-leftism, um, a third way, one that um, rejects the radicalism of the hot-headed soixante huitards um, as being unrealistic, as being daydreams, worse as being secretly authoritarian as being a backdoor to kind of Soviet totalitarianism of some form. But the question for us today, and with these thinkers, is how are they responding to a changing world? And in what sense are their responses adequate? That ultimately is a criterion of their usefulness for us. Okay, part two, what is postmodernism? Kind of follow straight on really i've kind of been telling you a bit about that already i'm going to give you a bit more of a, of a theoretical and historical background here so this guy jean francois Lyotard, um the first to introduce this how does he define postmodernism let me let's just let's just have the definition so that you know in case this ever comes up uh, in a pub quiz or in a lockdown quiz how do you define postmodern and where we want to have some, an answer that is a bit more sophisticated than just jargon or BS. Um, Leotard tells us, 1979, quote, simplifying to the extreme, I define postmodern as incredulity toward meta-narratives. That's it. Incredulity, suspicion. Suspicion toward meta-narratives. Now you're probably thinking here, what, what are meta narratives? Why can't these guys just have a more a more everyday term? Uh, and I think we mentioned this problem of reading difficult philosophy in a previous week. There's a good piece uh, by Bernard Williams in the London Review of Book called "On Hating and Despising Philosophy on the Difficulty of Philosophizing." But what does Leotard mean by meta narratives? A narrative, a story. Meta and overarching, I suppose, a general story. What he means by meta narratives are wider sweeping stories of historical progress or of historical change, by which he primarily, well, he primarily has in mind Marxism, historical materialism, the inevitability of communism arising from the contradictions of capitalism. But another meta, meta narrative uh, would be that of the Enlightenment. And of liberal progress that inevitably through the permeation of western humanist thinking the enlightenment ideas of Locke, of kant of parliamentary democracy um, of educating the wide uh, educating the populace we will inevitably have a kind of what more well, fukuyama will later call an end of history will end will inevitably reach one kind of superior society a very western society leotard is saying here no the postmodern condition has lost its faith in those sorts of stories and those sorts of dreams. So that is basically what's going off. I mentioned Jameson just earlier. David Harvey, another important one. I also the American link. So Jameson is American and Harvey is English, but he has been and was back then an academic in the United States. Both of these books come out in the mid late 1980s. I think I'm probably wrong. Maybe Harvey's 91. God, <laughs> should have checked. Um, but both, let's call them late 80s, and then you can correct me later. Um, are trying to diagnose um, a cultural condition which they then situate within, um, or Harvey in particular, within political and economic changes. Jameson is more looking at kind of film and media and art. We'll look at the examples of Jameson in a bit. Now I want to situate some of this postmodern talk. And meta narratives in a wider historical arc, just so we're not just thinking about the 80s and MTV. So, I want us to, in a way, go back to the start of this course 
to go about the uh, to think about the historical conditions in which our philosophers emerged and responded to. In particular, the problem of fascism, the problem of Nazism, which is a problem that has a, several constituent parts. It is the problem of how um, a charismatic psychopath like Hitler can come to power in a society that is apparently a democracy. It's also a problem of how um, a seemingly civilised people um, can acquiesce and support the violent persecution and then extermination of entire peoples. It's the problem also not just of, of Germans but of, of any population, how fear and terror can be used to create a very powerful and centralised quasi-military state. And then in France, it's the problem of collaboration. Why did some support the Vichy regime? Why did they collaborate with the Nazis? Knowing what fascism was, having seen it develop over some years. Why did liberal and left-wing political institutions in France collapse? Why, did, why were they not able to withstand? Why was there so much internal division? All of these are disquieting problems. They don't have easy answers. But in different ways, they undermined a narrative of progress that maybe had existed before, or at least before World War I, not World War II. That there was something about the Enlightenment of the late 18th century, the French, and in particular the American Revolution, or what are sometimes called the bourgeois revolutions of the mid-19th century, um, 1848, in which ultimately um, more and more working class men, working men, um, are given the right to vote. All of this was meant to tend in the direction in which we would see greater peace and greater prosperity. But yet in the mid-20th century, we saw the complete opposite. So our thinkers are responding to fascism in that way. And when Lyotard talks about incredulity toward meta-narratives, I don't think this began in 1979. I think we can go back to Adorno and Horkheimer's The Dialectic of Enlightenment, where there is also great incredulity toward a meta-narrative. In that sense, I'm trying to tell you, folks, uh, that postmodernism isn't shouldn't just be seen as an 80s, 90s thing. Enough of meta narrative, very relevant uh, to um, to the UK now, a nation uh, where the Tories remain very popular, and which is um, not just deeply amnesiac but still dreaming of its imperial past. Not all of us, but many, most, I would unfortunately say. The meta-narrative of imperial progress, of Western benevolence towards the rest of the world, as demonstrated in this image from 1886. We know what empire it's referring to. It's, it's the one where the sun never set, the map with all the bits of pink on it. Now, this isn't, the, this, is, this map isn't a map of the British Empire, at least it doesn't claim to be. It claims to be a map of the Imperial Federation. And the three values, one well, of the two values of this federation, are freedom and fraternity. Which are very interesting. I'm not sure um, if many in India or in much of colonised Africa would, would say that they were particularly free having a form of political self-determination, or women even, within Britain. Nor what fraternity means. Think about fraternity in the imagery of the border of this map. This is as much a statement as the map itself. We have the benign Britannia, with the trident in the centre, but the figures around. The the racialized imagery where those with a darker skin hue are usually portrayed being less clothed one is carrying a very heavy weight enough uh, is you know is, seems to be um have as a companion a kangaroo now the way that the british imagined themselves and justified their empire in the late 19th century when it's becoming increasingly expensive and difficult to hold on to and this is the same with the french empire um, which covered much of Western Africa and other places too. Um, 
was that they were they had a, a paternal role they were protecting their childlike subjects and they were helping them develop they were helping them become civilized so that one day although certainly no time soon they would be able to govern themselves but in in the meantime the 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 more nature like more childlike civilizations required and actually had a great deal to benefit from imperial rule they should be glad to be under the federation that's a meta narrative that's a meta narrative of western power and progress of rural britannia but britannia's rural subjects being also so grateful for this i mean here's a crock of shit but that's what we're dealing with here this is a meta narrative so it's a it's a story about political power and political responsibility and it's one that and we looked at this with france fanon is very shaken by the second world war for france and for britain most by the 50s 60s have lost all of their colonies apart from a small number they're not able to hold on to them bankrupt a new cold war takes place here. russia against the united states and what does that mean for our nostalgic former empires well the meta narrative goes into decline but imperial prestige does not think about the ways in which the french so violently held on to algeria so uh, viciously responded to algerians who wanted independence think about the men who drowned algerian protesters who drowned in the river seine think about france fanon think about the fall of the fourth republic so dreams don't always die we also have when we think about meta narratives and talking about the enlightenment first and then western imperialism the third is marxism or at least soviet marxism as a as a source of historical liberation this is an image from the uprising in hungary in 1956 head of stalin broken now hungary 1956 is a democratic uprising and there are kind of worker councils formed you know around budapest and other places what what they're demanding is a kind of democratic socialism and what they get is soviet tanks that roll in and violently crush the revolt this is an important moment for the left in the west it more or less leads to the emergence of uh, what we now call the new left western left intellectuals who did not want to affiliate with the soviet union because they now had come to recognize it rightly as deeply repressive so the yeah, there are these different movements happening here different meta narratives are coming are uh, disintegrating as adorno would say the aims of the enlightenment become stuck in the mud stuck in the mud of auschwitz so there are these different moments in which skepticism about our stories appears enlightenment decolonization anti-stalinism suspicion about the soviet union this had existed for some time in the west it wasn't just 56 um and then a kind of sense about how can we buy into or subscribe to universal and singular stories of historical progress what if these are deeply eurocentric what if they're patriarchal what if they're just ideology so this work this incredulity toward meta narratives which is, which Leotard says typifies 1979 typifies late 70s and 80s come on we have seen this develop for our course and in that sense there is some justification to to describe Foucault or Deleuze as postmodern, even though they don't ever say that they are, and they're not really sure what that term means. Because there is a wider suspicion. But shouldn't we be suspicious? Isn't that where our thinking now lies? In that sense, we shouldn't immediately poo-poo a term like postmodern. I mentioned enough of cultural changes that are happening in the 80s. I'm sure you can think of a lot of these too. I don't need to just rattle them out for you. Charlie Sheen uh, in front of a, a stock exchange computer. The nature of work was changing. The emergence of the computer, the computer at work, and then the personal computer. Power was changing. 
what work meant was changing. The factory was disappearing in the West. They all opened up elsewhere. They simply moved. The mines closed. They reopened elsewhere. But for the West, there was a kind of Western experience. It involves deindustrialization. It involves a shift to computing. It involves a, a huge period of economic growth, which is based on credit. Uh, it's based on financial deregulation, which enables there to be much more speculation um, about financial assets. Stock exchanges, financial stocks boom. Property booms in this period. House prices, but also commercial property. There are moments like the Big Bang in the UK. I think that's 1986. You might want to think here about the redevelopment of the Isle of Dogs, formerly uh, a dock, Docklands, you know, the, um, the West India docks. Um, and offers a working class area with a lot of social housing. A campaign among people in the community to regenerate the island once the jobs had kind of disappeared because the docks are closed because they couldn't get container ships up the Thames. Uh, to regenerate it to have light industries, even some for woodlands. And how go the government under Thatcher ends up just completely um, sweeping that to one side and allowing a semi private corporation. Um, to build what we now know as um, Canary Wharf and the DLR and, and whatnot there. Those working class communities, working class people were moved. They were gone. They are gone. Well, there's still a bit of that in the south of the Isle of Dogs. But this is, money is talking and money is driving change. Shopping centres, the credit card, chain stores. <laughs> of course, they existed before, didn't they? Let's not get too carried away. But new ch chain stores become much more common. There are the, the emergence of uh, what the French sociologist Marc Auger calls non-places, places that have no identity, that just look the same everywhere. Airports are what he had in mind. But you might want to think of shopping centres, malls, with the same brands that you might get in the United States or France or somewhere else. Cultural and regional specificity are disappearing. At the same time, when you get this in Frederick Jameson, there is a worry, there's a concern that um, artistic creation is also reducing. Because everything is getting much more concerned with just the image. Just what is shown in MTV or in a glossy advert, just what, what sells. There becomes much more of a penchant for um, retro, retro music for reusing and rehashing old styles and old characters rather than creating new stuff which is expensive and difficult and um, well I suppose on one level involves paying for and subsidizing a bohemian class and bohemia is also what had gone into decline since the 80s the squats the spaces for, ex uh, for experimentation and living were disappearing Also, to get this kind of sense of a new realism, we get this with Thatcher, there is no such thing as society, only individuals and their families. The new realism says that society doesn't exist. The new realism says that individuals have a right to strive for what they want, that, in, that human beings are naturally greedy, aggressive and competitive. And actually what politicians and society should do and encourage um, is these ambitious instincts, because these are entrepreneurial instincts. And these ambitious instincts and aggressive instincts um, allow the creation of new businesses, new business ideas. And as a sop to the left, this is accompanied by the idea of trickle down. That if we allow our bankers and our um, business folk um, to, um, to kind of pay much less tax and to, um, and to have much more free reign um, to uh, develop new projects and so on, I'm being a bit woolly here, um, then the wealth that they produce will actually benefit everyone else because they will be employing other people and they'll be giving other people jobs. So even if all the mines and factories have closed down and, and instead we've got Alan Sugar making Amstrad computers and computers, that's okay because there will be allied industries that will benefit. There will be cleaners, there will be some workers, although hardly any, um, by comparison, that will be employed. And the money will trickle down and they will pay some tax and that will go to society. Of course, none of this 
comes out. You also have famous in this time. Uh, I don't know if it's famous. It's not really famous, is it? Um, Margaret Thatcher's Walk in the Wilderness. And I think this is in Stockton or somewhere in the northeast where Thatcher in the mid 80s nod to show that she hasn't forgotten the, the left behind areas. It's a concept that we use nowadays, but was felt back then. She went on a on a walk of some uh, deindustrialized and derelict zones uh, to kind of show that she wasn't out of touch with the northern working class. So all of this is happening. Um, and this is something that Frederick Jameson talks about. He talks about the, the Western Bonaventure Hotel in Los Angeles. So we're, we're in a new kind of era, basically, in the 1980s. So new kinds of work, there's computing. Uh, Marxism has declined as a political force. New places to shop, new forms of entertainment, new forms of stylized and superficial art and music, MTV, the video. A new skepticism about narratives of progress, a new, a greater celebration of the individual and individualism. And Jameson, I mean, it's maybe slightly tenuous, um, you know, tries to explore some of this through this hotel. Um, which she kind of sees as um, as, as deeply postmodern, um, because it, it it attempts to kind of exclude the city around it. He calls it a hyperspace. Um, it's one in which um, it kind of provides within itself a whole new world, a whole, a whole a whole new kind of world, which kind of reflects the ways in which the global market and multinational corporations um, now dominate. Society now dominate politics. There's also a sense here that the nation state uh, no longer has the same hold that it did before. This has echoes in Francois Mitterrand's ha abandonment of the common plan because of this kind of because of a recession at the time, and because of a narrative that then arises, which is that the, Fran the French nation state um, isn't strong enough to resist globalization. It's, it's got to go with it. This is the direction of travel. You cannot resist it. Modernization is what Tony Blair would call it in the late 90s. Of course, we can resist it because these are not facts of nature. They're political decisions, but they're presented the facts of nature at the time. So this is what we're dealing with. OK, so in this section, we are going to be looking at Jean Baudrillard. We're going to begin with an overview of his life and who he was. Uh, and then we're going to start exploring some of the ideas um, of simulations and simulacra. So here he is. Um, Baudrillard, um, a French sociologist and thinker, um, born in 1929, passes away in 2007. Uh, um, coiner of many a good quote, how about this for Americans? Americans may have no identity, but they do have wonderful teeth. Baudrillard um, is a an interesting, playful, and towards the end of his life, or in the late 20th century, um, perhaps one of the more, maybe even the most well-known uh, French cultural theorists um, in the English-speaking world. Well-known in good and in bad ways. Um, the Times uh, obituary um, for him in 2007 had the title Postmodernist Provocateur and Cultural Theorist who blamed consumerism for destroying reality. And this idea of provocation is one that we're going to get to, when we, especially when we get to the idea of the Gulf War. So what to say about this man? Well, um, perhaps a little different to some of the other thinkers on our course, uh, Baudrillard is born to a working class family in Reims. Uh, he is the first um, in his family, I think, to go to university. So his background is sociology and he teaches sociology um, at, in, at the University of Paris 10 at Nanterre and like offers on this course like um, like Deleuze and Guattari and offers um, he ends up having a kind of status a kind of role uh, in the um, the disturbances of May 68. He begins kind of producing important academic work probably from the 70s and into the 1980s and 90s. So a little later than people like Foucault and Derrida, who we've covered already. Um, <clears throat> some of his interesting writing, well, his, his kind of his, his work varies. You know, he has a lot to say about um, photography. He was a keen photographer um, about the arts. 
He does some travel writing too. He writes a book called America, where he travels around America and he really he marvels at how people um, eat their um, eat their food while walking on the go and stuff like this. Uh, he also does the same in Japan. Um, his interests are rather like others on this course, like Derrida, like Lacan. He's interested in semiotics. He's interested in the structure of language. He's interested in signs and signifiers and what they mean and and importantly for us, keep in mind Derrida here, what happens when signifiers and signifies, when this relation breaks down? His writing style, um, especially as he goes on, gets more and more um, provocative, hyperbolic, declarative. Uh, and so this is where stuff like this, his claim that the Gulf War isn't taking place. Or, and we'll come to this in a moment, there are some links with the film The Matrix. But anyway, we're going to talk about this book. Uh, simulation and simulacra um, which comes out in 1981 so what is the thesis of this book well reality no longer exists it's been lost reality the kind of the the territorialized the earthed the authentic the genuine the true this has disappeared folks we've lost it We've lost it in a world of images, images in magazines and TV, virtual reality and video games, in simulations. Now this idea of the simulation, the representation is important. What's curious is that um, Baudrillard uh, begins uh, this work with a, a quote from Ecclesiastes which is made up. <laughs> Which is brilliant. Um, I mean, there's, maybe there's a slight basis in the book of Ecclesiastes, but not really. I think that's great. <laughs> anyway, we should be encouraging him, should we? Um, and so he says, well, so, I mean, I don't want to um, rain on, on Baudrillard's parade here, but um, those of you that know the work of Walter Benjamin, if you're English, Walter Benjamin, um, there's an essay of his called um, The Work of Art in the Age of, Me of um, Mechanical Reproduction. Um, and I think this is from the late 1920s. And this is where um, Benjamin says, well, you know, now the images like photographs are being re mass reproduced um, in, um, you know, magazines and so on or cinema. Um, something special is, is being lost in our relationship to the image being conveyed, say like the painting, which is then photographed. We're no longer in contact with its aura. It's kind of its special, it, its gravity, its gravitas. Maybe there's something like that happening in, no, don't look at that. <laughs> in what Baudrillard has got to say. Um, so his kind of concern is that in this, in this hyper-mediatized world, all we have are these different representations, these TV, film, fashion, pop culture representations. We've lost track of something that's authentic. Now, he has this term, it's an important term for Baudrillard, of the hyper-real. What is the hyper-real? Well, this quote gives us some direction. Baudrillard says, it is the generation by models of a real without origin or reality, a hyper-real. So it's not, I don't think of hyper-real in the sense of like a more amplified or intensified reality. In fact, it's, it's a kind of the opposite. It's something that, it's a kind of a surface presentation of something that seems like reality, but doesn't actually have much origin or basis. There are some examples of this before you start worrying. We'll get to them in a second. Now Baudrillard kind of draws out of this kind of um, media landscape um, a point about knowledge. A, a, a much more broader sweeping point which is that we can we no longer have access to truth keep in mind leotard here the incredulity toward meta narratives the loss of faith Baudrillard says this is um from elsewhere um ethics an essay called radical thought the simulacrum now hides not the truth but the fact that there is none so instead of you know having our, our good old fashioned stories of historical progress, of truth against what is false, of the signified being something that we can signify and all that kind of thing, no more. Instead all of that has been lost, it's been buried, 
been buried by the, the collapse of different progressive movements and dreams, been buried in the rubble of um, genocides and atrocities and catastrophe. Might want to think here of the angel of history of Walter Benjamin that I think we had in the first week. But it's also just been buried in the sheer banality, and here we're using a term from the situationists, and that is an important link um, of mass media, of consumer culture. So Bodhra makes this point that the map no longer corresponds to the territory. What does he mean by this? This is something that he introduces at the beginning of this book. Uh, it comes from a short story by uh, Jorge Lu Luis Borges. Um, and it's, just, and it's, it's about it's a, the creation of an impossible map, a map that is meant to kind of literally represent every place in an empire by being at the same scale. Now, Baudrillard uses this kind of concept of a map no longer corresponding to a territory to talk about the ways in which a map might have a kind of representation of what a place is like, but it's one that is no longer connected to its reality. It's inaccurate. It looks like it's true. It looks like it's real. It looks like it, t it represents somewhere, but it's just an image, one image amongst many others. Again, I want us to keep in mind with this context a kind of despair. <laughs> a despair that we get not so much in Raoul Van Agheim, but in Guy Debord, in the Society of the Spectacle. Two situationist works, but Debord, much more impressed, shall we say, with the power of capitalism to permeate our relationship with the world. Everything's just a spectacle. But more pessimistic about our chances of breaching the walls. Again, with the situation, this is also the background of the Frankfurt School. Consumer culture, selling us dreams, selling us personality traits, permeating into the minds of the young. Don't despair, you'll sit on the bottom of this um, early 1980s Apple Mac ad. Don't despair, there's one more thing you can do to persuade your parents to buy you a computer in which you can play video games that are kind of like reality, but not really. That's an important thing, isn't it? I think when Baudrillard is talking about this hyperreal, we need to keep in mind the effects of computing. You might also want to keep in mind here, um, if you put your mind back then, um, to the wild optimism about computing and virtual reality that existed in the, in the 80s, or in my experience, in the 90s. You know, there was a kind of sense, you know, people would put on these headsets and visit other worlds. That didn't quite happen. But this is the moment, isn't it? We don't know what is possible. This is a, an image here now from uh, a wonderful film by Orson Welles of Kafka's The Trial. Joseph Kay, he's guilt, deemed guilty, judged guilty, but he doesn't know what he's guilty of. He no longer has access to the law. He's striving to understand it. But the law in Kafka, this sense of an overarching transcendent um, truth or criterion of values has been lost. All we've got are the images. All we're doing is chasing after a truth which is always elusive, like Joseph K. I think in this scene he's kind of running and running. So Baudrillard, um, he has this he has this kind of term to describe this, the hyperreal. Um, in this work he just calls hyperreality quote, the generation by models of a real without origin or reality. I think I've actually had that quote before. Sorry. <laughs> um, so what's happening here to kind of feel that, well, there's these historical things you want to keep in mind. Changes in media, popular culture, consumerism, things being more about appearances. Um, a world in which media itself has much more power to kind of present in a more vivid way. I think of also video cassettes, um, things that are previously difficult to access that you might have had to have gone to a certain place for. Now you can enjoy them in your own home. Now in this work, Baudrillard presents um, four stages in which um, the, the direct relation of images to reality is slowly lost. Once the image, you might want to think of, of Derrida and what we looked at um, with um, social semiotics, the signifier and the signified. The image is a signifier. It is meant to represent a reality, the signified. 
this relation once upon a time folks was okay we were safe but it's been it's been lost um and this kind of takes place over a number of points first the the image kind of has a, an indirect relation to what it's trying to convey then it that relation becomes more and more masked until it becomes separated and Baudrillard has in mind here what is happening in popular culture and he, he ends up with this term the desert of the real and this is where it's a, a desert nothing is alive and what we have is just a series of, of images magazine video images they don't even try to be real instead they're like a, a vast Disneyland of imagery and the idea and Disney in, in a way is, is important it's important in France you know in, in terms of the of what Euro Disney meant to France some of you might have been to Euro Disney um, the big theme park uh, I think in the suburbs of Paris Disneyification not only does it represent a, a long-running, um, I guess at least since the Second World War, uh, concern of anxiety in French culture about Americanization, about the English language, Le Weekend, um, spreading and corrupting French culture. But also, I think you get this in Frederick Jameson too, the idea that Disney is, is pure postmodernism. Now you might be thinking, why is that? What's Disney got to do with it? Well, if you've been to Disney, um, Disneyland, um, have a think about what it's like when you first. Well, have a think about this image here, about the the cartoon characters. Um, that, well, they're, they're real people now, aren't they? But the people in the costumes are not. They're totally irrelevant because we enjoy these characters for being the characters they are. We go into Disneyland. There's all the uh, battlements and there's a the castle there, but. In most cases, these castles, you can't even go inside them. There's nothing to see or walk along. They're just pure surface appearance. But then the thing that matters most for Baudrillard is, um, what, is what happens after you go into Disneyland. And it's this place, you, some of you might know it, Main Street. You know that bit near the beginning where they've got all those fake shops and you can go into a few of them. Now, in Main Street, it's um, it's a version of reality that that doesn't even attempt to be real. Like, we know these aren't shops. We know that these aren't businesses. It kind of takes us to a place of fantasy. Um, of, uh, it's a, of, of an older America, these kind of wide boulevards and a sense of sort of joy and lightheartedness. Umberto um, Eco calls the place an authentic fake. It kind of, it seems, it has a seeming of reality, but... Everyone knows it's not real and it's not trying to be real. It's instead trying to take us to a dream or an image of the past. It's a better version of reality than the one we've got. Um, it gives us more reality. It's something that we can participate in more. So Bodrod finds Disneyland very interesting. And so he says, um, quote, The Disneyland imaginary is neither true or false. It is a deterrence machine set up in order to rejuvenate in reverse the fiction of the real whence the debility the infantile degeneration of this imaginary it's meant to be an infantile world in order to make us believe that the adults are elsewhere in the real world and to conceal the fact that real childishness is everywhere particularly among those adults who go there to act the child in order to foster illusions of their real childishness So it seems a deterrence machine, something that compensates for this condition of the hyperreal, in which images are no longer grounded to a reality, in which we can enjoy, we can consent, we can seek out participating in a world of appearances, in a world of simulacra. Because reality is lost, you know, we've chosen things that are better than reality, we've chosen worlds based on our own fantasy. And so a place like Disneyland, Budrod isn't trying to just say this is awful, let's, you know, let's shut it down. He's trying to say, well, actually, let's think and reflect on the fact that these places are highly comforting, that people really want to go to them, um, and that they, they offer powerful psychological consolations. They allow adults to be children again. Now, Budrod also has a link to 
this film, The Matrix, which some of you might know, might know well. A uh, film from the late 90s. Now, in The Matrix, um, what we have, we have an ordinary man um, who one day comes to realise that the reality that he is in, which is basically late 90s America, a very familiar world, is actually not real. It has a number of glitches, a number of things which uh, do not seem consistent with reality at all. In the, over the course of the film, he becomes aware and is contacted by this group of adventurers um, that actually the reality that he has thought he lived in was completely fake. And that actually, all this time, he's he and the rest of the human race are, um, are about a century ahead in the future, and their bodies are all in vats like this. In vats, and their energy is consumed um, in order to kind of feed um, machines. And in order for the machines to um, you know keep the humans um, content and to not die, to continue being able to exploit them, they fill their minds with this remarkably powerful fantasy world. I hope I'm doing justice to the plot. I haven't seen it for a little while. Um, a famous part in The Matrix also is a trilogy. Um, there's a, a bit early on um, in the film, which has now become a right-wing meme, um, about whether you, about whether somebody who suddenly becomes um, aware of how dark and bleak and lonely the real world is, whether they want to kind of continue living with this knowledge or whether they would like to go back to their old life, whether um, ignorance might actually be bliss or uh, in the book of Ecclesiastes, where we increase knowledge, we increase sorrow. So do we want to be red pilled is the right wing meme. Do we want to take the red pill, the one of continued truth? And this is what our character, oh, shamefully I should have uh, looked this up Wikipedia before Neo, I think. Um, he decides that he, you know, he's going to seek the truth. He recognises that this is a world, or well, he has been in a world of the hyper real, a world of images without basis in reality. But he chooses to fight the machine to not just c protect his own freedom of that and the others who have escaped the matrix, this false reality that they live in, but also to try and liberate others, but only those who are ready for this freedom. It's a difficult freedom. It's interesting to think about this as, a, as maybe reflecting a cultural mood that existed in the late 1990s. This is from The Truman Show, Jim Carrey. Truman Show, enough a brilliant film. Some of you might know it. Um, the plot is simply that um, a man um, is the centre of what we now call um, a reality TV programme. He thinks he lives in a normal town in America. And um, you know he has a normal life, a normal job, normal family and so on. But actually everyone around him is an actor. Um, and he, is, he lives in a TV set. And his life has been watched, he almost like Big Brother, that TV program was watched in the late 90s and early 2000s. His life has been entertainment uh, for, for people for a very long time. And then, as the film goes on, he becomes aware that actually he's in a false reality. And so there's this really dramatic moment towards the end where he decides that he's going to row out. He's going to row out into the scene, he's going to keep rowing, even though he's been discouraged all his life from going too far, from straying too far, because that would ultimately then mean that he'd reached the end of the t TV studio. Um, and so there are all sorts of dramatic storms and stuff, but he keeps on going, and then he eventually gets to the end, and the horizon is actually a wall, and he climbs this staircase. So it's a remarkable moment. All of that has a bearing too. It's a, kind of, it's a refashioning of Plato's Cave in the Republic, isn't it? Uh, if you don't know the analogy of Plato's Cave, I suggest you look it up. Um, Plato presents it in the Republic to, to I guess, to kind of present two things. The main one is the, the radical nature um, of his understanding of human knowledge, which is that what we know isn't merely based on our sense impressions, which is the view of empiricism much later, 
this knowledge for our senses, what we see and hear and so on, only gives us a very indirect picture of what the nature of reality is. Because the nature of reality can only truly be grasped um, using things that are perfect, eternal, universal and never wrong, never inconsistent, never contradictory. Plato's problem with the senses is that they deliver co contrary knowledge. We're easily deceived by our senses. Whereas he is drawn, perhaps on one hand, maybe bearing influence of Pythagoras, uh, to the power of mathematics and geometry to kind of point to more universal truths that go outside of our animal, our human condition. But Plato also had in mind concepts like truth, like beauty, also having the same universality as, say, 2 plus 2 equals 4. But to kind of to know in this way and to have an account of knowledge in this way is to go against the majority of humankind who trust in their own sense impressions and trust in tradition. It's going to be lonely. It's going to be isolated. And so the analogy of the cave is of somebody. Well, it's of a, it's of a group of people representing humanity who are chained inside a cave. You see this in this image here. The figures on the right are chained together inside a, a cave so that they can only look in one direction. They have a wall behind them and they're all looking at um, shadow puppets on a wall that are illuminated by fire. And they're absolutely awestruck by these wonderful symbols, by the dance. They don't know where the um, images are coming from or why, but they're just entranced by what they see. Now, Plato's philosopher is not content with this. They somehow become free from the shackles and they decide to kind of climb out of the cave. And as they emerge, first from a group of men, they see that the source of these images was just puppets. And then they see other kind of figures who are kind of carrying and moving these puppets, you know, like almost like religious figures like monks or priests, who are effectively manipulating the, man the masses. This figure then manages to climb out of the cave. And when they climb out of the cave, they're blinded because they're seeing sunlight for the first time. And sunlight here is meant to represent universal truths, like like beauty or like 2 plus 2 equals 4. And at first they cannot see because all they're used, used to is the world of appearances. But then, gradually, they become aware of this wonderful power. And it's nothing like the impoverished world of the cave. But... Woe will befall anybody who goes back into the cave, because if the philosopher goes back into the cave, their peers, the manipulated masses, will view them as a madman and will try to kill them. That's the loneliness of the philosopher. That's the elitism inherent in Plato's outlook. It kind of explains his contempt for democracy. He doesn't trust the masses. But in each of these stories, well, Plato's cave, the Matrix, Baudrillard and the Hyperreal, what we're dealing with is a world of appearances. But Baudrillard perhaps is the most pessimistic because he doesn't believe there's any outside. There is only this and nothing else. Okay, let's talk about something that appears later in this book, in chapter 5, although it's a piece of writing that Baudrillard had written before on the Pompidou Centre. A place <laughs> Baudrillard really doesn't like. Um, so what what's the Pompidou Centre? Um, here, I should say, I'm talking about chapter 5, the Beauborg effect. Um, well, here, here it is, around the time of all these exterior pipes. And let's look at another more recent picture from the front. Now this, the Pompidou Centre, uh, was a brand new, widely praised art centre. Um, designed and built by Richard Rogers and co. Um, across the 1970s. It was built on the Plateau Beauborg, that's why uh, Baudrillard calls it the Beauborg Effect. Uh, and this was a part of Paris uh, that once had food markets, uh, Les Halles. Imagine like a working class area um, where the markets, you know, I think of here if, if um, oh, I don't know. Um, actually, in London, places like Covent Garden and Spitalfields still are used in some way. But let's imagine Covent Garden and, and Spitalfields. Um, well, Sp yeah, Spitalfields or say Smithfield were all knocked down, in order to, which was proposed in some of these cases to build a Ponzi art centre. Um, Portugal is, is kind of worried by what this means. Um, now, the building is considered an example of postmodern architecture. Think of the Bonaventura Hotel earlier, <coughs> or in London, Lloyd's Building. 
Um, all of the functions are on the outside. There's something playful, unconventional about it. Let's have enough look. Can I see this here? Um, but for Bourgeois, it's, it's, this is a worrying development because what you've had here is not just a sweeping away of a working class culture and district, but you've got something that instead turns art, turns the art, something that I guess we can see implied should be revered and respected into something that is merely a kind of tourist destination. Think of the role of the Tate modern today. It becomes merely, in his words, a carcass of flux and signs. A machine for making emptiness. Now, what does he mean by emptiness? I mean, this is the question that I want to think about. You know, why, did, why does he hate this place so much? Here's enough image. And... Here we can kind of see it in its place. Well, on one level, uh, Baudrillard is, is worried about um, the social implications, that there's a kind of social sanitization happening here. He talks about um, there being disinfection, a snobbish and hygienic design. Think of this in relation to the working class markets that were there before. But the also is that it's not just about what it's what it's built over, but it's what it then states about what the world is like now. This is that it reflects modern social relations, um, the cool, empty um, security guards everywhere, um, a place that discourages company, discourages hanging around. Culture, once a place of advancing progressive and unusual ideas and a place of experimentation, just becomes another spectacle as a place to visit. He says, only an interior void could have corresponded to the architectural envelope. So I want you to kind of think here about what this kind of worry, about what this kind of critique of the arts and the way that they recuperate radical ideas might mean, what it might resonate with. This is one of, an image of one, one of the things that you can view from the top. Well, to my mind, I think there's a lot of resonances here with the situationists. Return to normal. Don't vote, it changes nothing. And their concern about recuperation. We had this in Marcuse as well. His concern about, about one-dimensionality. About the ways in which artists and philosophers are easily recuperated and brought back into the, the capitalist system. The production of images. Images, adverts that try to sell us not just cars or Volkswagens, <laughs> paperbacks as Van Agheim talked about, but try to um, sell us things that no product can really offer us, which is personality, which is satisfaction, which is contentment. That's the promise of capitalism, to give us a freedom through buying goods. Now Baudrillard, talking about um, the Pompidou Centre, is worried about what this means for the counterculture. He thinks that the place has become, the counterculture itself has become neutralised. Radical imagery just becomes enough of a thing to be put on display in a gallery and gawped at. He says, quote, culture at Beauborg is crushed, twisted, cut out, and stamped into its tiniest basic elements. He then kind of ponders towards the end, you know, what, what should we do about this place? Um, what would be the most useful thing we could do with such a large uh, venue? And this is classic kind of pessimism. <laughs> he says nothing. Quote, nothing. Uh, the void that would have signified the disappearance of any culture of meaning uh, and aesthetic sentiment. But this is still too, rom too romantic and destructive. This void would have still had value as a masterpiece of antique culture. And then he imagines, like, what if the place could be turned into a, an infinite sprawling library, a vast kind of circular ruins of kind of a dangerous labyrinth. I mean, I don't know what health and safety laws would say about this, but this is the ways in which mundane, banal reality pisses on the dreams of the counterculture in the way that Baudrillard wants to protect. In any case, rather than this being a place of uh, cultural celebration, it becomes a, play, a monument of cultural deterrence. Bodrow makes a kind of a wider point towards the end, which is, um, I guess, an interesting one. It's that actually this this place, um, 
well, in, because the masses are coming to visit it as a tourist attraction, they will end up um, helping destroy any kind of pretense that the arts spoke for experimental culture. That this kind of amplifies a logic that's already prevalent in late capitalism, in which everything is merely simulation, is merely entertainment, is merely a, a kind of tourist attraction, is merely is entirely fake. Once even the arts become revealed to be just truly fake, enough a product of consumerism, then that's good. The more we can come to realise that there is no outside, the more the system will break. So Bodrod hopes actually the Pompidou will actually, it's, it's so bad it's good, it will help implode culture. So he has this kind of phrase, make Boborg bend, let's destroy the place. Where we be, I want us to talk about this briefly. I think uh, interesting comparisons for us would be something like the Tate Modern, um, or uh, the ways in which, say, in other cities around Britain, like Liverpool, um, or even Manchester, the redevelopment of docks and the, the, what's the Lowry Centre, Lowry Gallery, and the Lowry Shopping Centre, uh, the ways in which the arts become a key part of urban regeneration, which often involves a displacement of working class jobs and areas, although deindustrialization kind of sent them off anyway. Um, but how the arts become a way of, of propping up a new kind of finance and property speculation based capitalism. Maybe Bodrod, he's being over the top, but maybe he's onto something here. Okay, let's talk about the Gulf War. <laughs> he, he might lose you here. Um, so, this claim, there's no Gulf War, usually brought up very quickly with Bodrod. So, what, what on earth does he mean? What on earth are we talking about? Well, Bodrod claims in 1991, in three short essays that appear in English and French, in The Guardian and in the French newspaper Liberation, that yes, there is some fighting, a small amount of fighting. That would, would be, because he writes one essay before, one essay during, one essay after. There is some actual fighting happening, but it's not really a war. It's not a proper war. It's not like a war. It's not like how wars used to be. Because instead, what the war really is, you know, for the West, is a kind of media, it's a PR exercise. It's propaganda about Western power, Western military capabilities. And it's a war against um, an enemy that is it's completely unequal. It's not, it's, it's no kind of conventional war at all. Um, it's just, yeah. Instead, as Bodrod says, on the available evidence, an absence of images and profusion of commentary, we could suppose an immense promotional exercise. Now, this is an image from what would come to be known as the Highway of Death, in which the Americans, um, I don't know what the right word would be, massacred, I suppose, massacred um, uh, a long column of fleeing uh, Iraqi military. Remember the Gulf War, what is it about? Well, Saddam Hussein's Iraq, um, they invade Kuwait, and then the Americans get involved and, and dis defeat them very quickly. That's kind of, on one level, that's what happens. But there's something more here. Um, Bodrod uses the war to talk about his um to kind of to kind of give enough example of his understanding of the hyper real that because this war largely is a kind of pr exercise it all it tells us that something that even as real as war even as real as death um becomes something that becomes less grounded or even groundless from the nature of what a war should be like a war in which there are even sides a war in which there are actual images of the battles themselves. That's something that something says. You know, there are lots of images like this, like George Bush Senior sitting with American soldiers drinking Pepsi, and um, but there's very little about what actually happened in the battles. If battles, I don't think that's even the right word. Um, he, you know, he says that actually this was in this case it wasn't really a war. It was more like an, an atrocity, an atrocity that was a kind of media entertainment. But Rod also makes an interesting point that um, it wasn't just about American power, it was also about Saddam Hussein. 
that Saddam Hussein just his goal was really to stay in power. Um, and one curious thing, like, there might be reasons for this. He doesn't use it, the Iraqi Air Force in this at all. Instead, it's just the soldiers. And so um, uh, Bodrov says that he sacrifices the soldiers' lives in order to kind of stay in power. But he doesn't want to give up on his power, so he doesn't use all of his military means. So it's a kind of war that is kind of useful for both sides, for dealing with internal criti critics. But then how the war is kind of consumed in the West, it's just endless rolling news coverage with the same recycled old images, which don't really give us a fair representation of what the fight took place. In one, in one place, he compares it to um, penalty shootouts in the World Cup, you might think in 1990, and a tragedy for England losing on a penalty shootout. Baudrillard describes it, the Gulf was an empty war. Quote, it brings to mind those games in World Cup football which often had to be decided by penalties. Sorry, spectacle, he says in brackets. So the Gulf War, in his view, is nothing more than a, a shameless and pointless hoax. Shameful and pointless hoax, I should say. So what he's not doing is saying that this war did not take place. That fighting did take place. People lost their lives. That is not under dispute. But it's about what war means and how war is represented in the West. In the West, there wasn't really, um, there, was, there was too much kind of propaganda and too much kind of filtering away of actual images of combat. The real nature and reasons for the war were not disclosed to the public. Instead, it was a kind of show of strength and American bravura um, at a point in which the Soviet Union, well, it was, was collapsing. I think by this point, it, it was disappearing um, or it had disappeared. Um, in that sense, it's not really a war. It's maybe it's not an atrocity either, but it's something that we will see much. We'll see this again with American military involvement in the Middle East in the early 2000s. That this is about power and image, and this has got almost less to do with it's got less to do with the Middle East and more to do with what's happening in the United States and its global position. Now, this uh, there's a lot of kind of predictable outcry because it just sounds like complete bollocks isn't it the idea that oh what does he mean this poncy french theorist um you know saying that a war, war didn't take place what is there anything that these french philosophers will not stoop to any untruth that they will not grasp onto and present and promote because they're all out of touch elitists this in particular fed into this narrative in the english-speaking world among uh, the conservative right a narrative that feeds into a kind of a deeply entrenched anti-intellectualism in the English-speaking world. And it was kind of, Bodra becomes, you know, almost a mascot of uh, the excesses of postmodernism because they it's not just that with Derrida, they, they think that there's no such thing as truth and everything's a language game. Derrida doesn't say this, but that's how it's, that's the story that's told. But now Bodra is saying something that is objectively true is not objectively true. You know, whatever next? Anyway, just as a slight, there becomes uh, increasingly a backlash against postmodernism and what postmodern means. One thing, this is actually really, really funny, um, there is the uh, postmodernism uh, generator, and it's a text generator. And this is the, the web address is at the top. It's uh, www.elsewhere.org slash POMO. And uh, this guy at an Australian university um, has kind of, I don't know what he's done, but he, you, it creates a random entry every time for about four or five paragraphs of postmodern text. Usually it's some, it's got this kind of mishmash of philosophy and literature, um, but it's always meaningless in this title here, this is, because the computer has just come up with it, basically. <laughs> and so this is one example. Um, and just have a read of it. I mean, there is something, I mean, bear in mind, this is a computer script. I think Bojo would like this, actually, this kind of, but this is, you know, is this not a, a brilliant simulacrum? Um, but it just comes across as, as complete BS, doesn't it? Um, and sometimes it, this, you know, this, you might read this laughing because this is probably, you might, this might have been like how it was when you were kind of reading through some of the stuff earlier in this course. It, it kind of it looks like it's meaningful, but what does it mean? The first sentence: If one examines the dialectic paradigm of discourse, one is faced with a choice: either reject pre-cultural narrative or conclude that the task of the observer is social comment. 
I mean, what's going off? What is the dialectic paradigm? What do we mean by discourse? What is pre-cultural narrative? Why is this an evil choice? But soon we're lost, aren't we? Because what does any of this mean? Anyway, check it out. It will make you laugh. Okay, so we're dealing with a kind of backlash here. Um, and it wasn't just with the postmodernism generator. There are rough things happening. If you haven't heard, there's um, something that's now known as the SoCal uh, controversy, where Alan SoCal, uh, a mathematician, um, submits um, a work that is flagrantly wrong um, to um, what's a journal called Social Theory or Social Text. He submits um, an article which is based on really flawed, completely wrong, contradictory um, statements about maths and other things. Um, and lots of it doesn't make any sense, but it looks really learned and clever. He su submits it to a kind of cutting edge postmodernism type journal, an English speaking one, and it's accepted. And then so Carl says, well, there we go, you know, if they'll, they'll publish this nonsense, and he knows it's complete nonsense, then what other rubbish is filling through? And so the so Carl controversy is a moment in which um, postmodernism becomes further discredited. Alan Sokar and Jean Brickmont uh, write a book together called Fashionable Nonsense. That's what they call postmodernism. And so this is how they describe Baudrillard. They describe it as, quote, a gradual crescendo of nonsense. <laughs> One finds in Baudrillard's works a profusion of scientific terms used with total disregard for their meaning and, above all, in a context where they are manifestly irrelevant. Whether or not one interprets them as metaphors, it is hard to see what role they could play except to give an appearance of profundity to trite observations about sociology or history. They have a lot of harsh things to say about others, maybe justified. Because they're not saying that the, um, the self-critique about power relations and knowledge is invalid. What well, Their objection is to the ways in which people like Lacan, uh, Irigaray and others, Badiou later on as well, um, will use in terms from advanced mathematics, or physics and elsewhere, and they'll just drop them in in order to advance a political or cultural argument in a way that is often ignorant and specious. Um, Irigaray talks about um, uh, Einstein's E equals MC squared as a distinctly male proposition, and this basically makes so Carl and Brickmont laugh their heads off. There's a lot on this, on the backlash, and it's about these excesses. Maybe there is, some, there is an excess in pretending to be a learned mathematician when you're talking out your ass. But does that then discredit um, the, the wider cultural theory, one that is trying to respond to a changing media landscape? changing nature of war, the changing nature of work, by looking at things that have become decentered, where the social fabric has disintegrated, which we could see in lots of different ways. There is something inherently worthwhile in that, and there is also something inherently worthwhile in what Leotard um, called incredulity toward meta-narratives, a suspicion um, that certain simplistic stories of historical progress are true and are worth giving up our lives for. Leotard, Baudrillard, many others, all question this in different ways. There's something irresponsible about giving up our, 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 our own responsibility to ourselves, our desires, and other people that we care about, um, to sweeping ideologies. What it calls for is more nuance, more care. But what we see in Baudrillard, at least, is more pessimism. Okay. So just on his legacy, and then we're going to start rounding up. So he is kind of, I mean, his, the mantle in the English speaking world has been taken over by Zizek, I would say. In the early 2000s, 90s, you know, he's kind of well known as this kind of irreverent provocateur. Now, is he taking the piss? I think this is this would be, no, he's not, well, it's not about that. Um... But I think there's something there's something about provocation, isn't there? There's something that is trying to um, do something in thought that Deleuze wanted to take place, which is to force an encounter with something that's different and unusual. Socrates himself is someone who kind of shocks and scandalises uh, the people that he speaks to by presenting things that they find deeply confusing. 
Diogenes of Sinope, uh, the founder of the school of cynics who lived in a barrel, um, barely clothed and would often um, do his bodily uh, functions in public, also sought to scandalize, but in order to kind of begin a discussion about what is human, what makes us human and what makes us natural beings. And why do we conceal this through the artifices of civilization? And whose civilization? Baudrillard says, and this is a good way of, of appreciating what he's trying to do. It is a task of radical thought, since the world is given to us in unintelligibility, that we don't understand it, to make it more unintelligible, more enigmatic, and ultimately more fabulous. Well, does he succeed? Okay, let's start rounding up on our course. We've covered a lot, I would say. Uh, Foucault, Fanon, uh, Lacan, Derrida, Deleuze, Deleuze and Guattari, The Situation is International, uh, Sisu, Uigre, Baudrillard today. I wonder if I've left anyone off here. Um, I can't remember. So a question for you to think about, now that we've got the Kana to the end. Has there been any particular thinker that's really impressed you, that's really uh, struck you, that you found really meaningful and interesting? Someone whose works you might want to go back and read again. Somebody who maybe annoyed the hell out of you, but it was a very productive uh, being annoyed. <laughs> if so, I would really encourage you after this to explore more and read more. And something that we talked about in our Zoom sessions is the necessity and value of using secondary study guides in order to get into the um, the difficult, sometimes necessarily difficult uh, nature and also presentation of these thinkers. If there's any, if you want any recommendations on anything, please send me an email. We've covered, yeah, we've covered tons, haven't we? Wow. Yeah. Um, I've just I kind of, I've talked for a long time. This is a bit of a, a list of the kind of key works. So our course has probably has covered a, a 45 year period. Um, we began with the three H's. We talked about Sartre, existentialism as a humanism. Simone de Beauvoir came up last week. Jacques Lacan's seminars in 1953. Bart's mythologies, we talked about that in the first week. 57. Wonderful films, French New Wave from the late 50s. 1961. It's 60s, really, where things dwell. History of Man, the Stretch of the Earth. Deleuze starts producing important work, Nietzsche and Philosophy in 62. Foucault's The Order of Things in 66. Lacan becomes even bigger in 66 with the published, uh, a published collection of his writings. 1967 is um, Derrida's um, Annus Mirabilis uh, of Grammatology, works of the Situationists. 68, wow, we know what happens then. 70, the turn to Spinoza, which, well, actually Deleuze writes a book on Spinoza, um, uh, The Problem of Expressionism in Spinoza in 68 too. Anti-Oedipus, and what we see over the 70s is a kind of a reduction, in, I suppose, in some kinds of activity. So that becomes more attuned to the nature of power, the relations of power. Foucault's Discipline and Punish is a key work, highly recommended to you. We have works of theoretical feminism, Sisu and Rigore. Deleuze and Guattari's A Thousand Plateaus in 1980. We, we lose a lot of people in 1980 as well. Baudrillard, today. And then look, I've kind of, well, I've skipped a bit of the 80s, but less happens then. But it's not all over, is it? Zizek. What I want to think about here are people that, um, thinkers who are today popular, relevant, valuable, useful, interesting, who, if this course were con to continue for another 10 weeks, we would end up looking at. We would look at Zizek, we'd spend a couple of weeks on him because he writes so much. Um, very much shaped by Lacan and Hegel. Judith Butler's enough, a gender trouble of 1990, but many other works. Also very influenced by this kind of late 20th century um, flourishing of experimental thinking in France. I give my Foucault. Etienne Balabar, wonderful man, great thinker. Uh, he's written some important work on Spinoza, but actually his expertise touches all of these philosophers. And, uh, an associate of Alphacer as well, in his younger years. I mentioned how much I loved this book when I was younger, Empire, 
by Tony Negri on the left and Michael Hart on the right. And they produced other kind of work subsequently. But I guess what we've been dealing with here on this course is a certain period, which has mainly been the 1960s. And it's a period that Derrida, much later, writing in, a, in Le Monde newspaper in 2004, he talks about him being part of a generation of writers, a, a generation that he playfully called the incorruptibles. I think that's kind of a, a punning a little bit on, um, oh, what is that guy called? Um, Robespierre. Um, and what are the incorruptibles? Well, there's the influence of Nietzsche, Marx and Freud, but it's something different. It's a kind of way of thinking in a way of writing. Derrida says it is, quote, an intransigent, even incorruptible ethos of writing and thinking without concession, even to philosophy and not letting public opinion, the media or the phantasm of an intimidating readership frighten or force us into simplifying or repressing. Hence the strict taste for refinement, paradox and aporia. They won't be forced by public opinion, the media or the readers into simplifying what they think, because this is an ethos that is intransigent, it's unflexible, unbending and deeply experimental and creative. It's trying to do something with thought. It's trying to produce not just a new content of thought, but a new, new ways of thinking, a new lines of flight as Deleuze and Guattari would see, a multiplicity of ideas, ways in which we can get beyond Hegel and Hegelianism, get beyond the idea that there is one historical arc, one view of truth, one story of progress, and instead recognise that human beings are by their nature manifold, are by their nature multiple, that we do differ, and that these differences are not just problems for liberal democracies, so you know, you need to be accommodated by a kind of... Um, reluctant pluralism but they are the best of human life difference is our greatest strength and difference is something that is expressed it is enacted and it exists between people and it exists through us how do we become different how do we become other and how do we become hospitable and compassionate to the other well in a certain sense it involves a recognition of the distinctiveness of our own selves and it involves something that was important to Foucault um, later in his life, um, which I mentioned earlier, the, the care of the self. Being oneself as a form of ascesis, the Greek word for exercise, training, discovery. And how does one become oneself in thought or in our lives? Except for the sometimes lonely and dogged um, exploration of our own ideas, our own images and our own desires. Now, we saw with Spinoza that this shouldn't be done alone, it should be done with others. The good life is a collective life. For Spinoza, friendship really matters. For Deleuze and Guattari, our relation to others are everything. What our thinkers should be kind of seen within the wider arc of, I would say, is something that does come from the Enlightenment, which is uh, an unflinching emphasis on the value of human freedom. And human freedom being something that we must be responsible for. We must be responsible for our own freedom, our own autonomy. We must be responsible for our own ideas. We must be responsible for the ways in which we are strong or weak, the ways in which we hurt or harm others. And in that then, as Foucault said of Deleuze and Guattari, is a very important ethical message. It's one that is constantly critical and questioning of power in a way in which conservative commentators in the English-speaking world are obviously afraid of. They use bogeyman terms like postmodernism and cultural Marxism in order to um, dismiss and diminish um, new political and social movements that are questioning old forms of tradition, old forms of authority. Sometimes people might be alienated by um, what these um, new social movements are trying to do, say around sexuality or um, sexual identity. But nonetheless, this is part of the same movement. It's a movement that when um, that... Tony Negri writing with Spinoza calls a kind of materialist tradition. It's one that's constantly suspicious of power, suspicious of myths, suspicious of tradition. And one through this kind of suspicion enables us to de debunk superstition, debunk the sources that exploit our fear and create strongmen and lead to fascism. In some sense, the thinkers on this course are guides to the non-fascist life. <laughs>
and that's the way I would use them. And in that sense, they are very useful for us today, and they, and they will be in the future. Okay, let's round up after that stirring, stirring call to action. Um, where do we end on that? Let's have a bit of Foucault. It's an interview by Foucault called Sex, Power and the Politics of Identity. And it's about how we always have the power to change. He's described someone's he's been asked, you know, what's he mean by power relations? Talked about this earlier. What I mean by power relations is that we are in a strategic situation towards each other, he says. We are in this struggle and the continuation of this situation can influence the behaviour or non behaviour of the other. So we are not trapped. We are always in this kind of situation. It means that we always have the possibilities of changing the situation. We cannot jump outside the situation, and there is no point where you are free from all power relations. But you can always change it. So what I've said does not mean that we are always trapped, but that we are always free. There is always the possibility of changing. Okay, I think this is a much better way of ending than the pessimism that we see in Baudrillard. But when we meet on Monday, we're going to talk mainly about Baudrillard, and then we're going to round up on the course. So what does Baudrillard mean by the hyperreal? Why is the Pompidou Centre so bad? Why did the Gulf War not take place? And then this will be a more interesting one for us. Which thing has been most meaningful and interesting to you overall on this course? Okay. Yeah, that's one to take place. Um, all right, because this is the last one. Uh, I just want to say thank you very much for, for being with me, uh, for watching these and for our classes on Zoom. They've been really, really interesting, nourishing. You've been a fantastic group. I've just absolutely loved our classes. Um, yeah, um, so this is going to be my it's my last class at Mary Ward, my last class like this, I don't know, for some time really. Um, but um, yeah, thank you everyone, it's been really, really great. Uh, and if you want to keep in touch, um, which I welcome, then I've got a blog, dantaylor.blog. All right, thanks very much everyone.